Welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about optimizing incremental ingestion in the context of a lake house. I'm Ivana and I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft, uh, helping customers with their data challenges. Uh, I worked in the past with Yoshi uh, on a couple of data projects uh, and we came up to the idea that incremental ingestion is an interesting topic um, and we can uh, share some of the some of the topics that we think are relevant in this case. I'll give the word to Yoshi. All right, thanks Ivana. Uh, yeah, I'm Yoshi Coppens. I'm a data engineer for Element61. I've been working a couple of years uh, with Ivana before. Uh, I think my main focus now is mostly about DevOps, Databricks, and uh, Azure Cloud uh, engineering. All right, cool, let's get started. Uh, so just as a general note, uh, all our code is written in Python, uh, or more specifically, PySpark. Uh, just so you know that you, if you see some yeah, code that it's not Scala or something else. All right, problem setting. Incremental ingestion. Is not an easy thing. Uh, so we know there's quite some struggles that can appear uh, with increment in incremental ingestion, and I'll walk you through a few of those. Uh, first of all, for example, you can you will be dealing with a lot of different data sources. Uh, whether you're talking about uh, data from an on-prem database, data from a cloud database, data coming from APIs, data coming from IoT devices, there's a lot of data, different data sources. And they all will require a bit of a different approach uh, on how to tackle them. Uh, what also can be the case is that you're dealing with different extraction frequencies. Uh, here we're mainly talking about things you want to do every hour, things you want to do once uh, every second, like very real time. There can be quite some differences there, which also will make it a bit more tedious and chaotic to maintain. Uh, as well, what's the case is, especially if you're comparing uh, a real-time flow and a batch flow, you will require some different logic or some different code to keep track of new and processed files. And we'll dive into those subjects uh, in all of the, uh, in most of those subjects, subjects uh, later in the presentation, especially the custom logic one uh, will be an interesting topic. So if we then look a bit at batch and streaming in, in, in particular, uh, both really have their advantages and disadvantages. When you're talking about batch, you're talking about doing something once every X minutes, hours, days. Uh, it means that also, uh, because you do it only once, the compute is also only needed at that time, only at execution, which means, yeah, it could take five minutes, uh, then it only will cost you the five minutes, uh, which is quite cheap uh, because there will be a limited time where it's executed. The big downside is of course that you, first of all, you don't have really real-time data. And also, yeah, you don't really have the metadata handling as well from a stream where it keeps track of what was new and whatnot. Uh, if you then look at the stream, that's really a continuous flow. It runs 24 seven, uh, which means it's also very expensive because yeah, of just having a cluster running the whole time will set you back quite a, quite a lot of money. Uh, so when you don't need it, you don't do it. But of course, for some cases, it can be quite interesting. Uh, if you need real-time data, for example, then it's a given that you have to do this because uh, there's no other way. Uh, but some systems can only do batch uh, and do not support streams. Uh, for example, you have Kafka, that's very easy to put into a stream. And we will see later on that files, uh, file systems or file shares can also be put in a stream, but it's always a bit trickier. Uh, some data is not really fitted that well uh, for streaming. However, ideally, you do not want to switch between batch and streaming. Ideally, you have one main code base to maintain, which is, uh, especially when you're talking about going from bronze to silver, silver to gold, at least those flows should be yeah, supporting on the same code base and not really having to differ when it's a batch or a stream, because ideally you want to treat all your data the same way. Uh, also the requirements of when and how load data can change, with, which can also make it a bit trickier as well. For example, yeah, if you want to switch between batch and streaming, then it's quite tricky because there will be some different data between a batch data and stream data. Uh, the data structure is different, like I said. And then also you don't really have any flexibility to do these switches, which is not nice. And then if you're talking about KPIs and monitoring, well, batch and streaming, they're also different. So you will have different KPIs. It will be quite 
tricky to keep track of everything. So that's why actually today we will take you to a journey where we're trying to transform the batch flows into streaming flows uh, with uh, the advantages of both sides. Uh, but we'll uh, make that clearer when we uh, go on. So first off, we need to start with Spark structured streaming. So uh, I'll give the definition once because there's quite a few words in there that actually are all quite important. Uh, but structured streaming provides fast, scalable, fault tolerant, end to end, exactly once stream processing. Uh, and you don't really have to reason about streaming. I think all of these words are quite important. The two main ones I think are fault tolerant, which means that if something goes wrong, it's not necessarily an issue, which is, yeah. Quite nice. And also exactly once, uh, the last word is very important because everything should be just yeah, done once. Because otherwise you will be dealing with duplicates, which means your logic will be trickier to maintain and it has uh, some issues. So how does it work? Actually, behind the scenes, the live data stream, actually it looks like a table that content continuously gets appended rows. And so in that sense, it quite uh, quite easy to see how it would work. Uh, what is nice is that structured streaming, it does not really materialize the entire table. And so it does not keep track of the whole table, of the whole life table. It only keeps the minimal intermediate state data that it needs. And we'll, we'll show some example later on, but for example, for late arriving data, it will allow some data to be late if you want to do some aggregations. But also it will limit it because if you keep all your data, then it becomes very expensive memory wise and your clusters might yeah, break down. Uh, structured streaming is possible for multiple sources and uh, event streaming. Yeah, Kafka is a big one there and a, a familiar one probably, but also files. Uh, so files, new files coming in is also something that Spark structured streaming uh, can work with. So how does this look in code? Well, actually it looks quite easy. Uh, nothing much changes. Uh, so instead of a dot read and a dot write, it becomes dot read stream and dot write stream. Uh, the only thing is that there will be different configurations with it. You can already see this on line seven, where the write stream, uh, you end with an option with the path instead of saving to a path, and you actually start the stream instead of doing the save command which is a, a small difference, uh, uh, but yeah, in a sense, nothing much changes in your codes. So there's a lot of configurations you can set with streaming. Uh, I will go through a couple of them, just the ones that we think are quite relevant uh, for this presentation, but also generally uh, when you were talking about streaming. Uh, so first off, the output modes. So the output modes, that's really about uh, not the data coming in, but how do you actually, yeah, have your result table, your output table. How do you actually build that one up? And there's three modes there. There's the complete mode where yeah, every time something new comes in, the complete table is written, uh, which will require you to maintain the logic yourself. Uh, then you have the append mode where only new appended rows will be written, which is nice if your data can fit that way. But generally, your data will be updated, there will be some merges needed, and then you will need the update mode. Uh, and there, only the updated rows will be written. So that will be the, the main one. Uh, then checkpointing. Uh, so checkpointing is actually are really important in streaming because what it does is that it actually allows you when, when you shut down your stream or when your stream suddenly fails, that it remembers, oh, where should I now start off from? And it's very important to yeah, make sure that we only process everything once and we make sure it's fault tolerant and the two things I've mentioned. Well, checkpointing, checkpointing is really yeah, kind of the, the real thing that holds that together. Uh, so how does the, the storing actually happen? Well, it's actually just on a data lake. Uh, you can just have a different folder checkpoint or check and there you can actually uh, keep your query progress, uh, which is just in a different folder next to your data. Uh, another function, uh, I would say, is the for each batch uh, function. And that's actually something that allows you to just write custom logic, uh, like any logic that you can write in Spark, which will be applied on each batch of new data. So we'll go a bit deeper into what constitutes a batch. Uh, but let's say six new rows, no new rows come in. You want to process these in a, in a certain way. Then you can do it for each batch to actually 
do your computations on those six new rows. Uh, what you will do then as well is if you want to write or save your data to a table, that will also go into the for each batch uh, logic. Uh, then two other uh, configurations which are quite interesting, and that's especially when you're dealing with late arriving data and aggregations, is windowing and watermarking. And so first of all, windowing, that's a way actually to apply transformation over a sliding window of data, uh, which means that, for example, uh, you want to record 10 minute periods and over those 10 minute periods, you want to have the aggregates and that you want to have stored in a table. Well, therefore you, you can use windowing to make sure that you group on these 10 minute tables at uh, 10 minutes uh, windows. But then actually, yeah, if you think about it, if, if you don't make a cutoff point of where you actually, yeah, want it to keep data in memory, because it could keep all the data in memory or it could keep only the 10 minutes. But then if you only keep the 10 minutes, you don't really allow for late arriving data. So that's where watermarking can come in, where you can say, okay, I will allow data to be delayed four minutes, but not more than that. So then it will just keep the data that it needed to build up, allowing for the late arriving data, but making sure that your memory doesn't uh, explode. So if we now look at it, how this looks in codes, then yeah, putting it all together here, you can see there the for each batch, which will run a function, a function that we have def defined yeah, somewhere else in our notebook. And the function itself will do the actual save uh, to a table. Here it's an append mode, uh, could be uh, anything else as well. And you can see there as well, the checkpoint location will just be a part to a different uh, directory. So that's Spark Structure Streaming. It's quite nice, but yeah, what's the downside? Yeah, you need some kind of checkpointing, which add metadata, metadata that we don't have in batch, which makes it a bit different. Uh, also, you can write in batch, but then if you switch between batch and streaming, Spark Structure Streaming doesn't really work that well with it. And then yeah, how do you keep all your transactions assets? And because Spark Air is known that you can have some corrupt files, which are then really tricky to actually get some fixes for this. And actually there, the solution is quite simple or quite well known as well, I think. It's the Delta Lake. So uh, in our journey of going from a batch to a streaming, uh, from a batch like fashion to stream like fashion for batch flows. We'll have a couple of yeah, points that we'll try to cross off to make sure that we're on the right way. And you can see them listed here. Assets, unified streaming and batch, flexibility of switching between the two, how to process new changes and how to incrementally discover new files. So the Delta Lake. Delta Lake, what does it solve? Uh, like I mentioned, one thing that can happen is corrupted data or unsaved data getting into your yeah, tables. And that's really not something you want. So that Delta Lake solves with asset transactions. It makes sure that everything is processed nicely before we move on to the next transaction. Uh, something that Delta Lake also covers is the, you can just mix batch and streaming. It's no problem because the sinks and the source will be the same, uh, which is really nice. Uh, and then there's some other, like the rest of relevant for this presentation, but also still quite relevant. Uh, it will be able to do some schema evolution, some schema enforcement. You can time travel, which means you can go back a couple of days to see what the state of your data was then. And there's some metadata handling that happens uh, in a Delta Lake. Uh, so those things are all uh, included. How does it look in the codes? Well, quite simple. Instead of format parquet, which will be writing parquet files, you can just do format delta. Uh, it's quite easy to change that. Uh, as well, you can do it in a, in a SQL command, for example, create table da, 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 using delta location and your path. Uh, so that's actually quite simple. So what we have right now is we've already tackled the two first ones. We have assets and we have unified streaming and batch, which means yeah, our data can be located in one place, uh, which is already quite nice. So what is nice as well now, the trigger one functionality. So first I'll talk a bit about triggers in Databricks and what do they do? Well, actually triggers, they determine how often a query should produce results. Uh, which means, for example, uh, do you want to 
look at your new data every minute, every 10 minutes, all of the time. That's the kind of thing it's uh, talking about. Uh, so what are the options available? You have processing time, which means every X seconds or X minutes or X milliseconds even, it will check uh, what are my new rows and it will process all of those new rows. Uh, like a micro batch query will run every X seconds. That's kind of the standard one. If you're talking about the default trigger setting, it will be a processing time with zero seconds, which basically means it will do a batch as quickly as possible. And when it's finished, it will do another batch. And then when it's finished, it will do another batch, just everything as quickly as possible. So that's processing time will work in batches. Then you have the continuous mode, which is quite interesting because that one is a continuous query and there will be some checkpointing every X seconds, but the query will be continuous. So the new rows will come in and they will get processed immediately. So if you're going for low latency, then continuous is really the, the mode you're looking for. But then at the other end of the spectrum, if you're looking not for latency, but for more a batch-like fashion, then you're looking at trigger once. So trigger once, what is it? It's actually a trigger setting that makes sure that you can run a streaming query, but you can immediately stop it. And so you can actually trigger it once. And that actually is quite nice because then you're having a stream, but you're running it in a batch-like fashion. How this looks in code is that you have the dot trigger once is true uh, option in your stream uh, when you're writing. Uh, and that's actually quite nice because then you can just uh, compute wise, this is quite great because you can just run your stream once and then it just, it functions as a stream, but you don't have the compute of having your cluster needing to run 24-7, uh, which is uh, very nice. Uh, one downside on this trigger once is that it will be executed in exactly one micro batch. So that can be quite annoying when you have, yeah, let's say if you trigger once per day and you have quite a lot of data, one micro batch is a lot of data. So then it's a bit, yeah, not uh, great because you don't really use Spark uh, as power of where it can easily do stuff in parallel and can easily optimize your compute when you have, we're talking about different batches. But uh, so Databricks or Spark, at least they realize this as well. So there's a new function. Uh, it's introduced quite recently. I think it came to Databricks in November 2021 uh, you, in Databricks Runtime 10.1. Uh, and it actually is the same as Trigger once, but it can be split into multiple batches. That's so it really can allow Spark to just do its magic and, and compute everything uh, as quickly uh, as possible. So if we're looking at our state uh, thus far, we can uh, check uh, another box, uh, we now have the flexibility of switching between stream and batch. It's no issue. And actually we can look at a batch stream via a stream. Uh, so that's actually quite nice. And then now I will give the word to my colleague, Eva. Thank you, Yashim. So now we want to only process uh, the new files or the new changes. Uh, and that's where Delta change fit comes uh, in comes handy. Uh, so now uh, for the Delta change fit, we are gonna see actually how that works um, in practice. So let's say, let's say we have a silver uh, Delta Lake table in our data lake and a gold table, uh, again, Delta Lake in our data lake. Uh, and we have a process which is uh, doing something with the silver data, aggregates it and puts it into gold. But we here don't want to every time we have an update, for example, we don't want to then read everything in the file. So to, to reprocess a lot of the old records as well, but we would instead want to do that more efficiently and just process the, the records that actually changed. So if we have an example, if we look at the table uh, in the left corner, we have first uh, two, I two rows uh, with two IDs and values A and B. And in the next uh, ingestion, we actually see that we have a new record now uh, with ID three and value C, but we also see that the record uh, number two has changed and the value now is B2. So if we would translate this uh, and we are using the change data fit from Delta, 
we can see that we are going to have an extra column, which is called change type. And here we will see what is the operation that happened. So we can see that record three was inserted. Record two was updated. So we can we are always going to get the two, uh, the two versions. So the one before the update and the one after the update. So with this, uh, with enabling Delta change data fit, we're gonna uh, downstream from silver to gold only the records or the rows that have actually changed, which is uh, way more efficient than just maybe reprocessing uh, a lot of a lot of the older records as well. So how can we configure this? Uh, it can be configured in batch and in streaming. So if you have enabled it on on, on a Delta table and you just want to check uh, what has changed between two versions of the table, you can just read the format Delta. Uh, if you look on the left, uh, we can have the option read change data feed to true. And then we can say what is the version between which versions do we want to see the records. This can also easily be uh, replaced with a timestamp so, time so that we can check what uh, records have changed between two timestamps. In a streaming way, it's quite similar. Again, we are, uh, now have just the read stream. We have the Delta format that we are reading. Read change data feed is enabled to true, and we are just uh, giving them the start version from where we want to stream this. So with Delta change data feed, um, now we can tick also another box, uh, uh, and then we can now process only the newest changes. So if we are looking at our journey today, uh, our, our state so far, uh, there's only one box uh, left to tick to have, a, to have successfully transformed our batch into, uh, into stream processing. Uh, let's see how we can incrementally discover new files. And here we are gonna talk about autoloader. Uh, Yoshi already mentioned that uh, in the beginning uh, of the known struggles uh, is that uh, for incremental ingestion is that you have to sometimes build a custom logic to define which file has been processed already and what are the files that we have to still process. And this is where Autoloader actually helps us. Uh, it uh, helps us with the incremental ingestion of the data from data lakes. Uh, by uh, but it works with two modes. We're gonna check them. We're gonna check them soon. But it actually knows which data has arrived uh, now and what is the data that we still have to process. It can efficiently discover uh, so the new files. Uh, it can easily scale with the number of ingested files. Uh, we can detect schema changes and we can decide if we want to do schema evolution with it. And uh, the new files can be discovered by avoiding the directory listing, which we all know can be uh, quite an expensive operation. Uh, if we would put this into an architecture uh, in Azure, we would do it like uh, on the left, or sorry, on the right uh, side here, where we have many different data sources that uh, we are have that we are ingesting with a pipeline from data factory. And we are pushing them to our data lake, but we can also have sources who are directly pushing into our data lake. And then uh, from Databricks, we have autoloader enabled, which can then either uh, list the directory that we have uh, asked him to, or uh, it can uh, listen to a queue and uh, get the notifications of which file has arrived now and what is the file we have to process. Uh, how can we configure Autoloader? Uh, we can just now specify that the format will be cloud files and that will automatically then trigger that it's uh, an Autoloader option. Uh, and we can then specify what type of files we have in our data lakes, either parquet, JSON, CSVs, or other files. There are a couple of, uh, there are actually a lot of options. I'm just gonna mention a couple of them here, uh, which I think are relevant. Allow overrides, so if your files are overwritten, uh, it's important to enable this option if you want to always then reprocess them again. Backfill interval uh, to do some asynchronous backfills uh, at uh, some times in the day, for example, once a day. Uh, and then to include existing files. So if you're already starting this on a folder which has data already, uh, if you want to include that data as well, you can uh, enable this option 
uh, two. So quite simple. Um, then we mentioned also that uh, autoloader is able to do schema inference, but also schema evolution. For the schema inference, uh, how that's done is by sampling the first 50 gigabytes of data or the first thousand files uh, that it finds. But uh, you also have the possibility to provide a schema location to avoid this, uh, or you can also give some schema hints. So if you're doing schema inference, it can be that maybe one column that um, you know might be uh, inferred differently. For example, here uh, it's date that it inferred it as a string, but we know it should be of a type date. So we can give a schema hint, like in the code uh, below, cloud files, those schema uh, hints where date is date, and then it's gonna read the, the schema correctly. Uh, if the schema changes, so uh, a new column is added, we can uh, define the schema evolution mode, what we want to, uh, for in the stream to happen. Do we want to add the new column? We can fail the stream. If a new column is added, we can rescue it in a separate location, or we can do not, nothing. Uh, so we don't want to, uh, to evolve the schema. Uh, I mentioned already there are two modes of how autoloader can work uh, by either uh, having file notifications or directory, directory listing. The directory listing is the one you see on the right. Uh, it's uh, the most simple and the default option that you have. So you have a file which comes in your block storage, in your data lake, and you will have to actually do a lookup. So you have to list the directory to find what the new file is. In some, in some cases, incremental directory listing is also possible, but if it's not possible, then maybe, we, uh, and you have a lot of data that arrives in your directory, then maybe a file notification can be a better option as then you will avoid to have to list uh, many, many uh, different files, uh, which can, as we said, be a very expensive operation. For the file notifications, uh, we are gonna use event grid, which is created automatically when we enable autoloader on the data lake. So as, a new, as soon as a new file comes, um, then it's uh, gonna put it into the queue, into the storage queue, and then autoloader will uh, process the new file that uh, has arrived. So uh, by introducing autoloader and having incremental ingestion to incrementally discover the new files without having to build a custom logic, we can tick now all the boxes, but don't we then have no issues at all? Well, not, not really. We have to think about change data capture. So our sources that we are ingesting should be able or should be enabled for incremental ingestion. By this, I mean, Either they need to have a column which, which specifies the version of the row, or it needs to have maybe an update timestamp where we can see which row has been updated when, so that we can do the incremental ingestion. Without this, we are at the end uh, stuck with the full loads uh, anyways. So uh, to conclude, uh, with all the things that we mentioned today, if, uh, if we look at how our architecture would look like, so for a batch, we would typically in Azure use data factory to ingest our data from the different sources and put it into our bronze layer. And then from there on, we could use autoloader to detect when a new file has come and use Spark structured streaming, but together with the trigger available now option so that we can transform the stream into a batch-like fashion. And then we can put it into the Silver Lake in a Delta format. Uh, if we have a process which uh, combines and aggregates some data from silver to gold, but since we have data that is updated, we are going to apply the change data fit from the silver to gold so that we can just take the newest uh, changes of the data. And then to conclude, we can now easily unify the batch and stream. Uh, we can get the best of both worlds. Uh, it's easier uh, and more efficient incremental ingestion if we combine them. Uh, with streaming, we know which data is new and can work uh, with failures easily and can recover from them and have the asset transactions. And with batch, we can reduce the cost uh, of com yeah, for compute, but uh, only when no latency uh, requirement is set. 
And important, as, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, your data source needs to allow for incremental ingestion. All right, thank you for your attention. I hope you liked the presentation.